Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for novices and masters alike. I say welcome back because you should have been listening all this time. If this is your first one, go back to number one because now we're on number three. Well, no, stick around for this. Well, yeah, well, Stick around for this. Stick around. They are not like, it's not like, (laughs) it's not like a novel where you will like not understand what's going on because you missed the setup from the first 29 chapters. It's issue 30 of a comic book. You got to go back and read the first one to get to know where we are now. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have, of course, Dan with me as, of course, is Josh, as always. Hi, everybody. Yeah. And on today's podcast, we'll be discussing all things cultural, historical, quizzical, and cagorsical, because today, after we get through the email, stick around, orcs. Orcs. And what they mean to Earth Dawn and where they came from and why they are named as such. So that's the historical part. But if you have any questions for us, because we're going to get to some emails here in a second, email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And we will get to your questions because we have a couple of questions here from some, I think, longtime listeners because they've been throwing us some weird ones here. Uh, so this <laughs> one comes from, I think it's Jan or Jan. Take your pick. Thanks for the superb podcast. You strike a nice balance between concise presentation of a topic and the entertaining ramblings of two madmen. <laughs> that's what we're aiming for glad you picked up on that that's exactly what we're doing and we're going to keep up with that and he says thanks for holding up the flag for the hands down best fantasy setting an rpg there was is and uh, will ever be so we agree that's why we're here yeah well at least until i finally find time to do my own custom setting but that's down the road I'll contribute if Josh wants me to. So his questions are A, B, and C. They are they are juicy questions. <laughs> Has the Servos more or less been where it is before the Scourge? If there are overgrown ruins somewhere in it, well, of course there are, uh, would they be from civilizations that didn't make it through the Scourge? Are they even older? Yes. <laughs> to all of that. <laughs> um, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Is it is it more or less where it was before the scourge? Yes, at least as indicated by the information on the Cathan tribesmen of the Servos jungle. Um, in the the humans section, we talked about humans a few episodes ago. Yeah, the the Cathan tribes were always in the jungle, and so the jungle was there before. I mean, the exact borders obviously may have shifted or not be exactly where they were in the past or whatnot. But basically, the the Servos jungle is indicated to have always been. The Servos jungle in the heart of the, in the heart of the province. Yeah, it, it just geologically speaking, I think it takes a lot to reroute a river. Yeah, but that's just me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are overgrown ruins, obviously, because what kind of setting would it be if we did not have jungle overgrown ruins in the jungle? Indiana Jones theme. I, I think I think more they would be from civilizations and, and places that didn't make it through the scourge. And at that point, rather than being like civilizations or nations, they would more likely be the ruins of ruined citadels, people who might have tried to build shelters uh, in the Servos jungle. Yeah. Or from towns or communities that that were that were in or made their living off of the jungle and might have since been uh, reclaimed by them. uh, If the people who originally lived there are now all gone for various reasons. Yes. It's certainly possible that there might be even older things there. um, Although there isn't anything that's been kind of hinted at in uh, any sort of officially published material that, that kind of leans along those lines. Um, It is certainly a possibility there. There are places where, there are supposedly really, really super ancient ruins from the previous Age of Magic, Irns Morgath being one example, uh, supposedly a ruined city that is in the mist swamps and lair of the great dragon Aban. But yeah, basically the, the cool thing about having a huge jungle in the middle of the area is that you can do all sorts of fun jungle exploration and lost cities and Indiana Jones escapades and stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Or Jumanji. Uh, absolutely. Welcome to the jungle. Or Jumanji. Exactly. Or, you know, any kind of, of classic, <laughs> like, pulp adventure exploration kind of thing. If you go full Predator, it might be a different game to play, though. You know, a, 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 a jungle is tremendously rich in various resources. And so while it can be uh, difficult to get deep into it, there are certainly lots of settlements and places that 
uh, might have been built on the edges to take advantage of something and fell upon hard times or have collapsed uh, or gone away for some reason. And so their ruins would be um, there as well. So it's not necessarily just pre-scourge things, but but perhaps some post-scourge as well. Yeah, there were a number of shards uh, from third edition, I believe, that were written to take place in the Servos jungle. So, Or on uh, the edge of it, yeah. Yeah, Journey to Lang, Into the Dark. Two I can think of right off the top of my head. So mm -hmm. there's a bunch. So second question, do you have shorthand art directions for different places and cultures? Something along the lines of Treverian fashion takes inspiration from real world Moroccan wardrobe in the 18th century, peppered with influences from Kenyan traditional embroidery, or Jerus soldiers equipped with shields similar to those of Gallic tribesmen from Caesarean times. We probably should, but we don't. We're not fashion mavens. So. Really? <laughs> We, we have a new art director, James Austin, who is cool and eager and asks questions like that. And yeah. our response is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, figure something out and run with it. You know, we were, you know, it's it kind of like there there isn't a lot of that. And that's actually a, something that hasn't been really e explored a whole lot. I mean, there's some aspect of it, like the, the Thrall source book kind of talks a lot about the, the bright colors and, and patterned mm -hmm. designs and things like that of, of Thrallic garb. Yeah. But it doesn't like, there's not a lot of like general discussion of, Oh, we're going to take these little bits and pieces from various historical cultures and kind of mash them together as the idea. Although um, thinking about it, the, direction sort of and, and ideas that I gave for the cover of Elven Nations um, was to kind of cross some of the stereotypical ideas of Elven artwork with sort of a Norse Scandinavian bent. Like Viking kind mm -hmm. of bent in terms of like that, that kind of knot work and, and idea and feeling um, being that it would be just Shosarin elves that they were up on the sort of up towards the Arctic circle and up in that, you know, they're, they're on a peninsula that's actually off of the, the European mainland of, of Russia, mm -hmm. as opposed to being, you know, Scandinavian. Yes. But, you know, just that kind of general, like Northern, uh, Northern European, where it gets really dark for long periods of time at certain points of the year and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's nothing that, that is like really, cohesively laid down but yeah we will occasionally kind of Steer do that sort of thing and... yeah, yeah i don't when, I, it, I, when I, it comes to uh to especially when it comes to like some art direction for books and whatnot yeah i also don't know if it extends into things like architecture versus just uh like i said you know garb and, and fashion again it it probably should <laughs> um that's not but it's not that's not something that was like in terms of the written text is not something that is that shows up a lot, even in, in the older books. A lot of that was informed by just the art. Fair. And the the one of the things that was the case, especially with first edition and early on, where a lot of the artists were all in house and working on stuff, they, you know, had a very sort of a relatively strong, cohesive art direction. And Fair. so you see a lot of the Mesoamerican step pyramid kind of Ziggurat. kind of flavor and feel ziggurats and, yeah. and and that kind of thing. But yeah, there I mean there are some aspects of the the artwork that kind of pays homage to the like traditional Western high fantasy ideas, but also takes its own approach to it. So yeah. yeah. Um, there, there is not really a, a, in terms of the specifics of the question, we don't have a setting Bible in that way that says, <laughs> oh, these people from this area, you know, aside from saying like perhaps that the, that Travar, you know, the number five is kind of important and yeah. has like the five dragons and, and like some of the stuff that goes on with that. Some of the stuff that you'll see in the artwork for the Iopos book, um, you know, when that, the full version of that gets released here in a, a couple of weeks or, or so will, uh you know, have that kind of thing in it. Fair. So uh, asked and answered, we'll kind of go with that. Uh, last question. This is a long one. So whenever he describes the concept of passions to his newbies, he describes them as beings born from and powered by, well, the passions of the name giver collective. So the passions are named 
different from continent to continent. And depending on how life goes, he believes there can be passions around that are different to those found in bar save. Now the theoretical experiment comes into play. Let's assume a considerably large populace of name givers were to move from another part of the world into bar save. Would their passion for whoever come along able to manifest in bar save with a limited strength or yeah. It depends on what you think the passions actually are. <laughs> I mean, so there. if you <laughs> if, you, if you read the opening chapter, the sort of introductory in-character chapter for the Questor's book, which was basically me talking about passions and saying, hey, here's all these things that are really different about them in all kinds of different places. And that yeah. raises all kinds of interesting questions. And, you know, are the passions basically personifications of name giver emotions and drives and desires that's certainly possible mm -hmm. it makes a little bit of sense based on what is known about them and what they value and how they behave but how much of that is purely driven by name givers how much of that is that they now have their own existence that is you know independent of that um, because clearly Certain traumatic events can cause a passion to go mad. What does that mean? Did mm -hmm. that mean that that Dis or or Rashomon slash Ragok was their change, their or Vestrial, their madness there early in the scourge? Something that was the result of something that happened to enough people within Bar Save that it shifted them? Or was it something that was imposed on them from outside? There's the, the legend of, of the Abyss of Aras Nehem, where perhaps the reason that those passions went mad is because they, in the defense of, of care Nehem, or uh, the care of Aras Nehem, yeah. um, where there was a portal that was allowing the horror Ristul to perhaps cross over, um, that they basically stopped it, and that they are perpetually within its influence and that is what's causing their madness there is a there is a theory uh that perhaps the passions are entities not identical to but perhaps in some ways akin to the horrors that rather than feeding off of negative energy like hate and fear pain. and pain that they actually feed off of Positive what energy. people consider to be positive emotions and energy. And so consequently, um, work to inspire those the same way that the horrors work to, to do things. Yeah. It's possible that the passions are just ridiculously powerful ally spirits or spirits of a type that are, or there's some, some kind of other deep astral entity that nobody really understands that have their own goals and some kind of alignment in the same way that some ally spirits uh, manifest and have, ideas and themes and whatnot that they go off of maybe the passions are, are like a, a much higher powerful level of that there are a lot of different things that you can play with and i <laughs> really like throwing a whole bunch of ideas out there for a couple of reasons one it might inspire a game master to do something interesting in their own game yeah two by throwing out vague hints and illusions and ideas without locking anything down before we need to it means that if we come up with something that is cool down the road that involves them, we have not, we don't need to backtrack or retcon. That's another advantage of presenting a lot of stuff in character. Yes. Is that, is that a, is that a scholar in the great library can speculate or say that they know why something is happening and can absolutely be mistaken mm -hmm. or wrong yes. or whatever. So it's a great big sandbox. A, 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 you know, a populace of name givers were to move from another part of the world into bar save. Would their passion for X come along? Maybe. Yeah. Who's Quite possibly. Say? Yeah. Who, who is to say? We don't know. Exactly. Um, and whether it manifests with limited strength or what depends on what you consider what their their nature to be and, and how and why they manifest. Yeah. Thank you, Jan, Jan, whoever. I'm probably mispronouncing your name. I do that a lot. Sorry about that. But yeah, good to hear from you. By all means, I hope we clarified that and you can email us again. So on to one from Corey. Corey, we got yours. Longtime listener, first time emailer. Enjoyed listening to the podcast and he didn't get much of a chance to play Earthon back in the day, but has only gotten back into it with fourth edition. Welcome back to the fold. Always like to hear that. Yep. He's begun a campaign and is using Earthon to introduce people who RPG experience has only been D&D &D 
in the wider world of RPGs. So let's make converts out of them all. So he's been meaning to, get, to send in a question regarding thread items for a couple of months now. We were asking. So if he was curious if characters would get their spent legend points back if their thread woven to a thread item was broken or unwoven, if they get the legend points back. If not, how do you feel getting those points back would impact the game if they did? As written, I would say not. The circumstances under which a thread to a thread item is broken or unwoven are, are fairly limited. Um, there are two main ways that that happens, again, as written. One is that the person dies, in which case, you know, if they are dead for long enough that like last chance salve or recovery spell or whatever like that can't bring them back, they are dead, their threads dissipate, and yes. that's that. Yes. Uh, and, you know, they're dead. Getting their legend points back is kind of you know, <laughs> academic at that point. Their life force is gone. The legend points are gone, too. <laughs> the The other way that that could conceivably happen is because thread items have a limited number of threads that can be woven to them. Mm -hmm. If uh, an item that, say, has just one – has one possible thread – is picked up by someone else and has a and and they weave a thread to it, then that first thread is displaced. In theory, you know, I, I don't think as written that they would get the legend points back. They would they have basically invested some of their magical energy, some of their some of their force, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. into the into their bond with the item, and that's broken. They wouldn't get it back. It's just gone. And usually if that's the case, that means that somebody else has the item. So Again, the, the circumstances under which that happened kind of make that a, a, a different question. I don't think it would hugely impact the game if you decided to refund the, the legend points, generally speaking, because depending on the experience level of the characters and how many legend points they have, might not be, in the grand scheme of things, that many legend points yeah. to begin with. You know, if you're talking about, say, like a, a novice tier item, and it's only got four ranks. It only costs novice. You're looking at one, two, two three, for three, five, three for six, four for, uh, for five, for, uh, yeah, 1,100 yeah. legend points, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that, if you're looking at a fifth, sixth, seventh circle character, a drop in that's, the bucket. <laughs> that's not, that's not a lot. Yeah. You know, it's basically what it, what it, but not, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't, I, I don't think it's hugely overbalancing. I it's mostly that I only see that being a question in particular circumstances. And it's something that I would probably approach from a standpoint of you're not happy with the item or something's not working for the, your character the way that you want. Let's rebuild it. Yeah. Um, or tweak it or change it or do something to to make this better for you um, rather than having it be something that is that comes about from the course of regular play yeah or maybe you just realized that this thing was cursed and you don't want it anymore yeah <laughs> i mean sure that that's the point where it but again as written you can't voluntarily unweave a thread you have created a, a permanent magical connection between you and the item yes and if it is cursed the ability to oh well i'm just gonna undo that connection and mm -hmm. i kind of like defeats the whole purpose of it being a, a cursed item in yes. the first place, mm -hmm. in, in some respects, and again, this is one of those things where it's like this is part of the story that we're being that we're telling. This is part of the the narrative, uh, part of the 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 story social contract that the contract that we have created as part of the group, and this is something we're aware of. Yes, rather than oh, this item is cursed, ha ha ha, you loser, I'm being a jerk to you, <laughs> nasty game master kind yes. of thing. I, I I don't think it would I don't think it would hugely impact the game. I'm just not. You know, it's just not as written, and I'm not sure under what circumstances um, that 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 would uh, that that would be fair. All right, thank you, Corey. Thank you. Yes, yeah. absolutely. On to the next. Uh, hello, guys. He's assuming we're guys. I'm just kidding. We are guys. Uh, okay, this question has a little bit of a backstory. At last night's game, I had my players in a bar. They were trying to find out what an NPC was writing in his corner table. The obsidian got the great idea of going by the table and looking on his way to the restroom. After the player said that. He then said, would that work? I know that obsidian need to eat and drink, but they are also asexual. So how would that work? That question got me to realize in all of my years of playing Earthdawn, I've never thought of that question. 
So his question is really, how does an obsidian go to the bathroom? Or do they even need to? Yes, they need to. They are living beings. Creatures. They are living beings. They have blood. They need to eat. They need to breathe. Yes. They need, you know, there there is a waste product that, that is generated Gonna as a result out. of their yeah. biological processes. Because mm-hmm. they are they are, you know, yes, they are kind of elemental stone spirit kind of things. Yep. But they are also they have blood. They breathe, breathe air. They, eat, they can whatever. drown. So, you know, there there yeah, there there is there is something that unlike spirits, there is something fundamentally biological about a, a obsidian. And so there would be waste and byproducts of their of those biological processes. Yeah. I had not really thought about it either. <laughs> nope. You know, I, I mean, to 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 expand that a little bit, to Scrang, do not have they they are while not asexual, mm-hmm. they are agendered. Yeah. When they are young, mm-hmm. and 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 the reveal of their you know male or or female status is not revealed in, until after until later on. Yeah, twelve ish, I think. That so you know, but but I would imagine that. Obsidian, while they don't have, well, they don't have reproductive sexual organs. organs. Well, they don't have reproductive organs. Let's go with that, yes. Yeah. Well, they don't have reproductive organs. They probably have other. They're going to have a you know, gastrointestinal system, and they're going to have a. Renal everybody, system. Poops. <laughs> everybody poops. Everybody poops. <laughs> we can. I can just stop beating around that bush right now because uh, they're just, going out in the yeah. woods. So, yeah, they have all the systems other than reproductive. Yeah, I that? mean, the 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 bathroom habits of name givers are not something that we really explore in any of the books. No, um, no, it's, it's you don't need to. They they they. I mean, well, except for the Muckers Guild and Thrall, like it is something <laughs> that, that does come up. We did we did bring that one up. Yes, we did talk about that. Yes, but it, just in general, yeah, um, it's kind of like a movie. Ab- absolutely, the you know they 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 might be. I mean, there are plenty of examples in the animal kingdom where the reproductive organs are completely separate from the waste yes. organs, mm-hmm. the waste orifices. Yes. And so, I don't know. It is not really talked about in any of the, the books. It's not talked about at all in um, Jack Hoke's Life Rock. Yeah. We're not, so, we don't talk about sex a whole lot on the show either with the, uh, the other name givers, but it's kind of like the bathroom scene in a movie. Th- there almost aren't any bathroom scenes right. in movies. When do these people eat? When do they go to the bathroom? You'll well, see them eating at a restaurant. They not... never go to the bathroom. If they go to, if, if there's a scene in the bathroom, something is happening, and then it's important. Right. It's not so just yeah. It's since not the cinnamon just... had to go to the bathroom, then it's important to know. <laughs> it's not just a case of I got to go. Excuse me. Exactly. Go off camera um, for four yeah, minutes. No, I mean back. with to to answer sort of the basic question: Would that work? Absolutely. Totally work. Absolutely. The the obsidian absolutely would have no it would not be weird in any way for the obsidian to make his way to the outhouse or whatever Latrine. situation yes. it is in that area that that is absolutely fine the specifics of it up to you <laughs> up to you they, they, they probably have an orifice somewhere on their lower torso similar to other name givers people. yeah they're, they're and built like beyond that beyond that that's that same thing so like i said they have every other internal system except for reproductive there's no yeah. organs for that. Everything else is normal. Make of that what you will. So that's that's my take on that one. Okay, we've spent 25 minutes on all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we can finally get into the orcs. The orcs. And I know maybe orcs one or awesome. one or two listeners have been waiting a while for this. I want to start off with something incredibly historical about orcs. Because they are not just from Tolkien, but Josh will make a point about that in a minute or so. Uh, there's actually a reference to one of the oldest texts of humankind in the real world uh, from Beowulf regarding orcs. Mm-hmm. The plural compound Orkneus was in a poem that I cannot read to you because it was in a well uh, long ago. It's an old English. Old English. But it, in that old English does mean evil spirits. And Beowulf also otherwise meant the underworld and walking corpses because the... It was understood as some sort of walking dead creature was the original form of orc or the plural orcus. But the early modern is from actually uh, Edmund Spencer's 1590 Fairy Queen. The Oxford English Dictionary records an early modern period orc, O-R-K-E, meaning ogre, in Sam Holland's 1656 fairy tale Don Zara. 
the pastiche of Spanish romances such as Don Quixote. It is presumed that Orc, or Ogre, both spelled with an E at the end, uh, came into English via continental fairy tales, especially from the 17th century French writer Charles Perrault, who borrowed most of his stories and developed his Ogre from the 16th century Italian writers Giovanni Francesco Straparola and Giambattista Basile, who wrote in the Naples dialect, stating that he was passing on oral folk tales from his region. Uh, in the tales, Basile uses Huerco, Huerco or Uerco, the Neapolitan form of Italian Orco, giant or monster, to describe a large, hairy, tusked, mannish beast who could speak, lived in a dark forest or garden, and might capture and eat humans. So the tale of orcs goes back centuries. Yes. And and the thing that, that's interesting um, with regards to when you're starting, to, when you start talking about stuff like this, that is this old, that has this deep. And, and so like the first, like the first recorded instances, we're talking like 1500s, 1600s, stuff like yeah, that, well. where these are things that are at least written. These are things that are coming up from fairy tales, which mm-hmm. are the oral traditions that were even older than that. Yes. And and when you start looking at stuff that's that old in, in terms of folklore mythological standpoint, you like, you know, the, the similarity and the connection between orc and ogre, that these are basically the same thing. Yes. And in our sort of present day, um, they are considered very different mm-hmm. creatures in the same. It's just a delineation of pronunciation. Yeah. In, in, in kind of the same way that if you look at like the historical folkloric roots of to choose a huge pop culture thing, mm-hmm. vampires. Yes. Some of the really old stuff around vampires, like vampires and werewolves, mm-hmm. which are nowadays often considered to be very different and often things that are in opposition. There is a lot of actual similarity in terms of the folkloric roots of the vampire and the werewolf uh, from certain parts of the world. And Dracula himself mm-hmm. in Bram Stoker's novel, like exhibited, not just like he exhibited the ability to transform into a wolf and to command wolves, which are things that are often attributed to werewolves yes. in present day. Yes. So. And even he was based upon a legend, Vlad the Impaler. Or, Sorry. So, so, but so, so the concept of an orc and the folkloric roots of, of, of orcs, which Tolkien was very well aware of mm-hmm. as a historian and scholar. linguist and scholar. And was deliberately drawing on Beowulf and similar ancient tales mm-hmm. to inform the creation of his own fictional history of England. Yes. Um, which is to say Middle Earth. You know, so, so Orc was, I'm sure, very deliberately chosen on his part to kind of harken back to that idea mm-hmm. of the ogre, of the, the monster in the woods, of the dark, you know, thing – that that is kind of a, a feature of, of fairy tales and a universal theme of such and and a, and a universal theme along those lines. You know, I mean, at that Crossing point, you're also tying cultures. into yeah. I mean, at that point, you're tying into themes similar to like Baba Yaga and similar kind of like they all kind of draw from the same ancient folkloric mm-hmm. myth pool. Yes, it's kind of interesting how over the course of even more recently, the past. 70 years, 80 years from basically the birth of fantasy as a genre, as a result uh, of modern fantasy, at least as a genre, as a result of of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And Robert E. Howard. Yes. Well, yeah. And and the the expansion and exploration and discussion and the subsequent in the 70s, like as a result of the, the wargaming stuff done by Gygax with Dungeons and Dragons and breaking up goblinoids where you've got your goblins and hobgoblins and bugbears and orcs and all of these end up being sort of starting to branch off and divide into their own little subgroups that may be related, Mm -hmm. but are considered to be different beings and different entities in the same way that you start to see um, similar delineations of different kinds of like fairy beings, you know, with, with brownies and, pukas and so forth each of which like come from different cultural backgrounds Mm -hmm. and have their have some similarities and and whatnot but to see that development from orcs as ogres as monsters in the woods as things that the hero of myth goes out and fights and slays or that is there as a boogeyman as a boogeyman or cautionary tale for children's stories about why you don't go out into the woods and things like that yeah 
And to see that develop, especially when you get into the 90s generation of games with Shadowrun and some of the other games that, that preceded that and mm-hmm. whatnot, to really see orcs developed as shifting from being a, a monster race, as an adversary race, as an inherently bad. evil, bad enemy force, mm-hmm. which is this whole kettle of fish that is fascinating. And I love listening to people who are much more knowledgeable than I on the history of that talking about the problematic roots of orcs in fantasy gaming. Yeah. But to see that shift, especially in Shadowrun and Earthdawn and games that start playing with similar themes of the idea of the orc as just another person. Yes. Um, that, that they may be stronger. They may have like sharper teeth or fangs or horns mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, kind of going Something a might make into them the physically different. Somebody that something that might make them physically different, physically frightening, yep. um, physically feral or animalistic in appearance, mm-hmm. even though that is not necessarily the case in terms of their actual intellect or behavior yeah. or ability to be people. Mm-hmm. Um, but to but to see that and in Shadowrun, the orcs and trolls to a certain extent, but the orcs especially um, in some takes on the setting were very were were used as a uh, as a metaphor as an allegory as a whatever for racism right? yes that that shifting that that rather than dealing with stuff in terms of the colors of the color of people's skin mm-hmm. but to deal with that as like metahuman versus me- human. metahuman yeah metahumanity and which you know, again, like takes a very interesting approach where a lot of the the classic fantasy depictions of orcs as barbarians, as uncivilized, and a lot of the language and descriptions and terms that are used are troublingly similar to the way that racist language is used in modern our world, our, in our in our modern world and, and our historical world yes. for the past hundred years you know, or so, several hundred years, <laughs> several hundred years, yes, I know. And, and to kind of make that as a parallel, it succeeded. It, sometimes it failed. Sometimes I think it was an interesting, I think it was an, a, an interesting thing to kind of take that and explicitly change the tenor of that discussion. Yes. And to say, the, these are the people, these, these are people that where these historical dis- descriptions and whatnot. And depictions, yes. Are being and depictions are being applied to them, but they are characters. They are people. They they can be heroic that you can play them, and they are being oppressed and you know and are and are facing difficulties in their society that are perhaps somewhat akin to struggles that are going on in our society today. Again, taking this in the context of late eighties, early nineties, but certainly I I think it. There's a there's a shadow run has the there's yeah there's there's a lot to unpack and a lot that we don't have time to get into here. It's okay, um, there's, I, you know, there's a long history of fantasy and sci-fi using those platforms of alienation, di- physical differences, ideological differences, and making an allegorical story out of that, so that you can mm-hmm. take those lessons to learn from there and apply them to real modern life, and so. Right. To Josh's point, uh, and I'm not going to summarize any better than you did. The <laughs> no, it was it was a nice stroke of writing and creativity to provide some redemptive qualities to an otherwise overlooked fantasy creation, where all orcs are bad, all orcs are evil, all orcs are you know this and this, or the Walking Dead, irredeemable the case may be. And, and exactly irredeemable yeah. and animalistic and so forth and so on. And so to put that in the light of yeah, well, put yourself in their shoes now. Right. You get to play but, an orc. The, but, and, and I do want to perhaps, like, put a little asterisk on that and say a disclaimer. Uh, again, late <laughs> 80s, early 90s, our yes. understanding of that situation today mm-hmm. and the way that – and and Shadowrun was not the first to do no, that. We're just, I am not completely up we're on just the, tying, the tying it. We're just kind of tying it into Earth time, yeah. Um and, and it would be very differently approached, I think, today. Agreed. You know, if, if somebody were trying to, to do that, um, and I think, and it was also, for the most part, again, 
late 80s, early 90s, written by white folks. You know, the, the, there are definitely some things that they that they got wrong, not necessarily out of malice no. or anything like that, but because that they don't have that lived experience and they don't understand Agreed. it. Anyway, all of that aside, yes. we come to the orcs and their presence in Earth Dawn. Earth Dawn, which does, again, owe some to Shadowrun in the sense that these are characters, that these are, are people that have a culture and a presence and are heroic in their own way, yes. you know, again, without without the baggage of an alignment system, mm -hmm. right, where people are inherently bad or good or evil or whatever, yes. um, that people are people and sometimes they're shitty and sometimes <laughs> they're heroic. Yes. And some, you know, and, and the same person, bag. depending on circumstances, can be like they're people with all of the potential complexity that goes along with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And the orcs in Earth Dawn have this legacy historically of slavery being the ones enslaved of, of having being the ones enslaved which these days as i think about it and consider it you know back in the 90s it was cool but given the historical context that we have all kind that we have just laid out here with regards to orcs as far as their role in fantasy and their depictions and things like that they weren't the only ones that were enslaved no but they are generally seen as, oh, they were the slave race. And the and while it is not, it's just a very rocky minefield to navigate. You you throw you in that, that S way. word, no matter what you do, it's going to right. be a minefield. And right. we're going to present this from two white guys. <laughs> yeah. Because we just happen to be the host of the podcast. But there is a you can draw all the comparisons you'd like to and any of the further discussion we're going to have. We're not going to tiptoe mm -hmm. around anything. We understand because a lot of cultures have had slavery involved in them on Earth over the past 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 years. And, and, and lest we be misconstrued in any way at all, slavery is shitty. Oh, God. For any reason. The most horrific thing. Slavery Second is, most horrific slavery thing. Slavery is awful. <laughs> um, we do not condone – slavery or the justifications that people might have for it. No. Sorry. Um, no. They're, you know, like, lest it be understood. As as someone who likes to hear other perspectives, who likes to hear other stories and to try and understand and empathize however I can with with other people, I recognize now more than I did even say five years ago, that there are some things about the orcs in Earth Dawn mm -hmm. that, while cool, make me uncomfortable, and I can imagine make people whose experience with that is a lot closer to it even more uncomfortable. Well said. And I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's something that, as we write material related to orcs, that I need to keep in my mind as a developer mm -hmm. and to make sure that we are dealing with things sensitively and that when we are talking about orcs and that whenever we're dealing with orc characters, um, we're trying to avoid broad brush stereotypes, stereotypes, trying to avoid a situation where, oh, this conflict on the border between Carafod and Landis is orcs versus humans you know yeah that that because especially if you're maybe looking at it from the human point of view that suddenly casts the orcs back into their stereotypical role of the emancipated slaves uh, well not even not even getting into that but of the barbarians at the gate of the dangerous mm -hmm. like creatures that go violent you know, kind of situation. And when you couple that with all of the historical context and the slavery thing and the idea that the, that Carafod is a nation that was refounded as a, as a kind of racial pride enclave, mm -hmm. there's just, there's just a lot of stuff that can sort of be forgiven by the way that it was originally conceived because of the time, but that as a result, I feel very like we need like we need to 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 strive to be better and to handle it better. And 
sometime, you know, we may succeed, we may stumble. Um, but I am well aware of that in terms of like the, the place and the role, you know, are, are there, there are unspoken or un, unexamined assumptions yes. that I have as a writer and, and a developer. And I, you know, strive to make sure that when we're doing something like that, that we are careful about it. Mm-hmm. And fortunately we all kind of try to, to, to check each other and, you know, hope that we are not upsetting or offending anybody through our, our casual ignorance. Fair. Okay. Disclaimers aside, breathe as I really Disclaimers aside, orcs are cool. Orcs are badass. Like, I really like orcs. Orcs are, you know, fiery and passionate, and they are, relatively speaking, they are shorter lived than other name givers. And that facet of their existence mm-hmm. has a, has a large, plays a large part into their philosophy because they live 40 years or, you know, 45 years, ish, yeah, uh, you know, ish, at best. <laughs> um, that, that they do not have, they do not have the time. They certainly don't have the time that, you know, elves. they don't have the time that humans do. They certainly don't have the time that elves do. Yes. You know, and, and so there is a very like passionate and that kind of plays into a lot of their cultural legacy and the stories that they find important as a people mm-hmm. are ones where that passion is followed through and ignited the story of their of the great liberation of the original founding of Carafad yes. was there with with Trak Gron and and the stories around that are about the passion and the the emotion and the internal fire of the orcs being awakened yes. after having been quenched and beaten down for for so <laughs> long of years you know and that they then go and they have their own aspect of things there is a very nomadic you know the 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 stereotypical idea of an orc in earth dawn is the orc cavalryman the nomadic Wanderer, bands yeah. a, akin to the step you know the the mongol steps mm-hmm. or the horde the mongol horde the mongol horde which has its own issues yeah, um, totally <laughs> but you know but but that that kind mm-hmm. of idea and and the 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 positive and almost sort of romantic and heroic aspects of it the 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 riders of rohan I think is a much better perhaps yes. uh, aspect to, to draw on that, or perhaps um, some of the, you know, uh, again, maybe a little bit questionable um, ideas of the, the, the horsemen of the, the native American, yeah, native American tribes, um, absolutely. Of, of the native Amer- of the, of the, the plains. A- admittedly horses were not introduced until very, very late in their culture. However, their, their, their culture. Um, but that but they adapted to it a, masterfully from, from a, well, from a, from a Western, fiction standpoint like that is an image that that again has its issues but is also very strong so there there's some of that so just like orcs are are like fiery and passionate and if you want a character that is going to think first or or act first and maybe think later orcs are generally not really back down much yeah you can certainly play a, a more thinky orc. I mean, Garlthic One Eye, the legendary thief, uh, leader of the legendary thief and leader of Kratos, yes, yes. did not get to be where he is by not being <laughs> a canny and cunning and intelligent individual. Yes, he is one to be reckoned you know, with. Not by one, you know, he is not one to go into a situation unthinking and unprepared. Oh, and he has absolutely uh, exceeded his life expectancy through. Yeah. Guile and cunning and bravery. So by all means, I also want to point out orcs, along with dwarves and humans, are the three most populous races in Barsave. But orcs yeah. are major contributors to uh, life and verve in Barsave as a whole, because, again, they were the workforce. And I'm going to use that term lightly, uh, the workforce mm-hmm. to construct half of the dwellings, buildings, canals, bridges in the lands, because they were, again, the workforce who did all that. Well, because there were, there were a large number of them and they are broadly speaking a little bit stronger, a little bit physically tougher um, and therefore would, you know, would be able to, to do that again, lots of problematic stuff, but like that, you know, that kind of goes draw your conclusions, but you know, like like I kind of said when we talked about elves, that they're ultimately 
the vast majority of orcs that are out there are just people that want to live alongside their neighbors and raise their families Absolutely. and, you know, do do all of that stuff. Yes. So there's always a misperception of orcs in Earth Dawn, just like there's a misperception of elves in Earth Dawn because people bring along their D&D kind of preconceived glasses with that first. So mm -hmm. we're here to clear the air on Earth Dawn orcs, which I think are one of the more redemptive portrayals of them as a race and as a species. Um, they're very prideful. They're very full of honor and they are lovers of a good tale. They don't necessarily like, eh, I don't have time to read. Eh, who cares about poetry? I'm here, you know, give me the stuff that life is made of. And it's the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the revelry and the verve and the, I can't, and just the, I can't call the, them adrenaline the junkies, to, but to it's grab <laughs> yeah, to, to the desire to, to make the most of the moment and to seize life and to, they are carpe you know, diem. Yeah. Dr to, to drink it, to drink it to its dregs. Yes. Um, down you know, and, and there, there are different ways that generally they can approach that and you can always play sort of against type. Yes. Um, you know, and, and whatnot, but the, but broadly speaking, the idea of the orcs as, you know, passionate, seizing life by the throat and shaking it. Yes. Um, is the term that they passionate, use. Passionate, courageous, in and nine times out of 10, undaunted. Yes. I, I, I came across somebody who had a tattoo on their arm that says, uh, live undaunted or never be daunted. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's an orc. That's an orc right there. Never be daunted. I have my best friend has nine different characters throughout all the versions of Earth Dawn and every last one of them is an orc. So and yeah. uh, we can't talk about orcs without talking about, as you said, Herat Gron, who is yep. the female liberator of the orc nation. She's the one who right. cast off the, the, the one the one who is the one who is credited with having led the orc people to freedom and rebellion. Uh, and, re you know, to leading the rebellion and leading to freedom and founding, you know, basically lead resulting in the founding of Carafad. Yes. Their their ancestral home. Yeah. So not to be um, now, uh, you know, that that is something that is largely a Barsavian orc perspective, mm -hmm. because a lot of what we're dealing with in Earthon is from the perspective of Barsave. Yes. Um, orcs in other parts of the world, say in, you know, Vasgothia or Talia or other or Cathay, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing would not have that cultural background. Agreed. Um, necessarily, mm -hmm. they they would likely still have that same kind of that same kind of like fire, perhaps and drive for life in a lot of cases. Yeah. But the the historical, the legendary tale of being a people that were in bondage and were liberated by a messiah figure mm -hmm. and consequently having a homeland of their own. I mean, heck, we've been talking about it sort of from a from a from a like black American kind of perspective as far as racial goes. But yes. who else was in bondage and had like, you know, you've got the 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 Hebrew the Jews tales, the, the, the Jews and Moses and yes. like a very similar. Like, I mean, that is a that is a that is a archetypal story yes. that shows up in a lot of different cultures in, in various various stripes and flavors so there there's that but obviously you've got Hatgron, you've got the gahad which is sort of the the, oh, the yeah. physiological response that kind of typifies why the orcs are as passionate and driven as they are um when when something triggers that passion one that thing fire will set it them, off they will they will act because if they don't act they will physically suffer yes. as, as a result and as we all know um whatever that may be angry people get things done <laughs> <laughs> they can be and that is what kahad is is that something that absolutely just burns inside you with a fire of a thousand suns and you need to quench that right now yeah you see red you get to your target and you take care of it whatever it may be mm -hmm. um but that's Gahad. And so, of course, we can't talk about orcs without talking about Gahad because I love the wrinkle that Gahad brings to Earth Dawn. I've got a player who has an orc who is literally undersized. So he's like four foot ten. So just just a runt of an orc. And you make one crack about his height, you set his Gahad off. That's all there is to it. It's like Joe, he's like Joe Pesci as an orc. Exactly. So something along those lines. Um, but the 
Interesting thing about orcs, and we're going to do this racial disparity here. I found a great, great quote in the original uh, essay from the Denizens of Barsay, Volume 2. While other races are judged by their heroes, orcs are always measured by their outlaws. Mm. And so it's that always constantly trying to overcome collectively known as the bad apples. The rest of the great race is fine. We have these two or three bad apples over here that make us all look bad. Whereas everybody else is measured by, hey, this guy, this elf over here did great. We don't care about the elf over there in the ditch. Uh, or, you know, the elf thief who ripped yeah, off the, like, the, three the kingdoms. Elves are, the elves are defined by, the elves are defined by Nyoka. Uh, Nyoka was a troll, wasn't she? Nyoka's boo, um, yes. Yeah. But, yeah, so they're all, but um, the elf queen's a garbage person. We know that. However, <laughs> elves are elves and humans and dwarves and so forth are revered for their heroes and their leaders and their legend makers. And orcs are always measured by their outlaws and their criminals and so forth and so on. So that is the I loved that aspect of <clears throat> Earth Dawn orcs. But it also yeah, that that legacy. Yeah. Again, it plays into problematic that. as it might be. <laughs> but yeah. It's it's a good storytelling thing to use, but it does have some reflections in real life. We're not going to deny that. However, to Josh's point about their passionate nature, their courageous nature, they're full of pride and honor. Orcs wear their feelings on their fists, not necessarily their sleeves. They wear no, them well, on their yeah, fists. Not, I mean, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily that they are going to punch you with their feelings. No, but uh, they will reach out with their feelings, yeah. good or bad. They... Uh, Deeply passionate uh, lovers, deeply passionate fighters. If you want somebody to have some gusto in it, get an orc uh, or befriend an orc and you go from there. There are uh, the overall views of three different kinds of orcs in the book. The city orc, which have lived alongside other name givers for generations yep. and have and, no problem. And those are, yeah. And, and those are the like regular, typically the regular everyday people. Yeah. As yep. broader brushes, the, you want the to merchant paint on those. and the you know the merchant and the farmer and the potter and everybody the, the bread the, maker you know whatever live live you know live right alongside and uh, just you know getting by day to day the same way that anybody yeah. else is. Uh, and then there's the raiders. Yep, also referred to sometimes as a scorchers. Totally. Uh, I love the name um, scorcher. They're it's great. They're yeah. They are the they are the when individuals in Bar Save talk about orcs being bad. Those are what they're pointing to. Yes. And again, like to, to go to the quote, you just said they are judged by their outlaws Yes, and that the, the, the scorcher bands, the raider bands are the ones that, you know, generally give orcs a broadly speaking, a bad reputation, mm -hmm. um, particularly in areas where there might not be as many orcs. Yeah. And so the only encounters that they might have with them would be these, these raiders and bandits. Even though there are raiders and bandits of Human. humans, like the riders of the Scorched Plain. Exactly. We covered that in the humans episode. So, exactly. Scorch, orc Scorchers get a bad name. Humans, human raiders do not necessarily get the same bad reputation. So, and then there's the third one, which is the cavalrymen, which is, I think, the orc's yes. true calling. And to your point, the, allego the allegorical similarity to native american nations who took to the, mm -hmm. to the mount fantastically and mastered it or quickly. or yeah or or the 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 riders of the asian steppes oh, or yes. the um you know to go from a, a again like i said earlier the riders of rohan mm -hmm. to draw something from tolkien yes but it was just like the the you know the 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 idea of freedom and movement and whatnot that sort of epitomizes the cavalrymen discipline in some respects yeah, and the the band of brotherhood that they have amongst mm -hmm. themselves yeah. so it's it's their band against everybody else because they're they're that cavalry and no one else is is going to understand it orcs don't really have they have a naming ritual because we've covered naming rituals for everybody else theirs usually comes to them in a form of a dream and there's two paths laid beside that uh orc before they're born one of which is domination and the other one is freedom if i'm quoting that correctly um, I'm not actually. Yeah. A lot of the, the essay in the, the Denizens, Denizens book, yeah. volume two tends to focus a lot on the nomadic cavalrymen orcs mm -hmm. in terms of their culture in large part, because the city orcs will be whatever 
is the dominant culture where they happen to live. Like whatever sort of cosmopolitan melting pot of human dwarf orc elf traditions might result based on where they are and, and the, the makeup of the people there. Yeah. Whereas the, the culture, the, the orc culture as it's presented is this is the culture of these nomadic groups that are largely racially mm -hmm. homogenous. Yes. You know, as opposed to the the mix that you'll see in other places in kind of the same way that troll culture is largely defined by the Crystal Raiders yeah. or, you know, and so forth, where these are the these isolated, largely of one dominated by one particular mm -hmm. racial group. And so that culture kind of seems to dominate the popular image, even though you have, you know, plenty of regular folks that are in the towns and cities in other places the Tuskrang, because of their aquatic nature and, and their, their ties with the river have that a lot more clearly than the others. Like you don't tend to see to out in the middle of nowhere away from stuff yeah. that, that the Tuskrang are all kind of defined by their relationship to the river. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the orcs and, and the presentation of the orcs and a lot of the material about the orcs ties to the, cavalryman nomadic culture that is typified by Carafad as as a culture yeah i found my quote it was the, the two paths are one of domination one of subjugation so either they ah, can okay. they can take life by the horns and make it theirs or they can not and that's the subjugation the life well we bad. all know we all know where that was yes yes so go from there the other thing i love about orcs in their entirety is the equality of the sexes. Harat Gron mm -hmm. was a female and she liberated the, the whole thing. And yeah, Krathis Gron was also, yes, Krathis Gron is also female and the, the chieftain of the, um, one of the prominent orc cavalry leaders is Zaras Isvot. Yes. Who's likewise a female. Yes. Um, there is a, a sense that one's gender does not, prevent you from like basically if you want something you go and you grab it yes. and your ability to to fill that is you know exactly and since i i, I there's a, a a comparison to be drawn as well at least a, a thought pattern thought process which is if they were going to throw off slavery entirely why would any one sex be more slavish to the other as well so why would you not have equality between them mm -hmm. i love that aspect so as i said very redemptive of the portrayal of orcs in Earth, it can be, yeah. yeah. Uh, certainly, certainly, you know, taken within the context that they were originally presented back in the '90s mm -hmm. as a response to Dungeons and Dragons, and to an extent carrying on the ideas that had been put forward in, in Shadowrun. Yes, you know, as a very like the the stories of them, you know, of of orcs as evil, senseless, barbaric faceless hordes mm -hmm. that need to be driven as far away from the lights of civilization as possible yeah. are people mm -hmm. just like you and me. And they have their own goals and desires. And those are the same as ours in terms of wanting to live their life on their terms and, you know, raise their family and stuff like that and be accepted for it. Absolutely. Uh, I also love the fact that orcs are more of a family of operation. They don't really have a marriage ceremony. And they'll have many, many mates over their lifetime. So it's just, mm -hmm. this is who I'm with now. Take care of the kids. We're good. Move very, very, <laughs> very sort of, uh, very sort of communal. Yes. In, in a sense of, of, you know, how the, the tribe, how the, the extended family group sort of, sort of operates again, talking about the, the cavalrymen, the, the Karad, uh, the Karafad culture. Yes. Um, in terms of, uh, and the, the nomadic stuff and how they operate as opposed to the city orcs who would be a, a bit more traditional mm -hmm. in terms of our perceptions of yeah. them. Uh, regarding their arts and crafts, just because it's fun to flesh them out as far as a full culture is concerned, they really prefer function over beauty. You can have an ornate sword and so forth and they'll just kind of look at you like, mine cuts just as well as yours does. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why do you need all that frilly stuff on there? That, that, that being said, yeah. as a result of their drive to grasp and get the most out of everything when an orc turns their mind to craft oh, absolutely they can be just as you know yeah just as amazing there's as uh, any other yeah there's nothing in orc 
there's nothing a human can do or a dwarf can do that an orc can't do just as well. So it's, right. yeah, the... Or better. Exactly. I loved in the original first edition rules, since there were racial restrictions. Obsidian couldn't do this, mm-hmm. women's couldn't do that. Orcs, dwarves, and humans could be, and I think elves could be any of them, any discipline at yeah. all. So they didn't leave orcs out. That was, I, I love that part as well. But the last thing I want to get to on orcs at all is the mannerly behavior. There's about 10 rules. I'm not sure who wrote them. I love them all. I've actually put them on a little note card for my friend who plays an orc regularly and he lives by these almost in real life is uh, say what you think in plain talk without weasel words. That's how to talk to an orc. Mm -hmm. Don't eat with one hand when you can eat with two. (laughs) (laughs) Never be the first at the table to stop drinking and always belch afterwards. Never wake a sleeping orc unless his life depends on it because they value their sleep as well. If you tell an orc he stinks, expect him to take it as a compliment. Do not expect him to wash. Spit to your left to show respect. Spit to your right to show disrespect when you meet them. I'm going to skip this one because actually it's not good in the times of COVID. It's about covering your mouth when you cough. Yeah, but when you greet or bid farewell, throw both arms around him and bite him on the neck as he does the same to you. If you bite too lightly, you may offend him by implying his flesh is too good for your tongue. If you bite too hard, you offend because you want to cause him injury. Never greet an orc by shaking his hand or offering him your upturned palm. Such gestures show your contempt of us because you have not bothered to learn our ways. Yeah. There's a, there's a little bit, um, like, if you think of some of the um, images that go along with, like, Norse, like, Viking culture from the Eddas and stuff like yeah. that in terms of the the warrior, sort of the warrior type culture mm-hmm. along those lines. Although there's not a lot of, like, really direct influence that you can see uh, in, in that yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the orcs, but like that can certainly be drawn on and, and just a very, again, like boisterous, lively, energetic, fervent, fervent, yeah. <laughs> you know, fervent, f- fervent and uh, culture and, uh, sort of like richness and everything like that. Uh, you know, orcs are, orcs are, are really cool context aside. Um, I really like them. Uh, they are, I am. They are not my favorite name giver race. We have talked about that already, yeah. but they are certainly like I. There's something that I can find to to like and play of any of the of the name giver races. Yeah. I haven't made an orc character yet, but after rereading all this and in the larger context of the world in 2020, I think my next character is going to be an orc because I need to make one and mm-hmm. haven't figured out discipline yet. But he's going to be an orc no matter what he does. So yeah, and I actually make um, a female orc because. Why not? Why not? Really, really quick oh, yeah, let's go um, stats. discussion stats. Of, of stats. Orcs get a plus three bonus. They start with a base strength of 13, which is basically a full step up on the the default baseline of 10, mm-hmm. which means that orcs are stronger right out of the gate. The only ones that are better than them in that regard are trolls and obsidian. Obsidian. Yeah. They get a, a little bit of a toughness bonus. They uh, don't aren't penalized at all on their dexterity. They are not penalized at all on their perception. They do get penalties to both willpower and charisma. The willpower penalty largely to tie into the theme for them of Gahad. of of Gahad and acting impulsively and things like that. It does mean that orc magicians, orc spellcasters, have a little bit of work to overcome but they've got a strength of 13 yeah so you as a magician you don't need to really put anything more into strength so you've got some extra points to to boost that up and when you get will force it evens out yeah (laughs) (laughs) and then you get um yeah and then a little bit of a of a charisma penalty which you know i i think largely relates to how the popular image of cavalrymen of nomadic orcs within Barsabian culture, which is largely Throlic culture, has kind of maybe a, a somewhat negative impression of that. Um, not necessarily to to reflect so much that orcs are more gullible or less personable or anything like that. No, I think it goes back to the don't use weasel words, they just call it blunt. And so they're, they're yeah. less flowery when it comes to language and uh, talking people into things. They just, here's my point, I've made it. And <laughs> yeah, so that's what I, I've always I talked mean, it's, it up to it's that. This, it's the same. 
It's the same charisma. It's the same charisma as an Obsidiman. So it's not like they're hugely penalized no, more so uh, as a result else, of that. No. And then they get um, a Karma Modifier 5, which is the second best Karma Modifier in the yeah. game. They share that with humans. Mm -hmm. uh, only better ones are Windlings, who get a 6. Um, which does mean that orcs actually get a little bit more of a karma reserve pool. Yeah. Um, if you are going to be playing a uh, a combat type character, if you're looking to play like a warrior or a swordmaster or a cavalryman, obviously, obviously yeah. beastmaster, um, anybody that that would be looking to have strength or toughness as a as a mm -hmm. important attribute, it's good to go with them. And then you've got a, a nice reserve of karma that you can use to to make things even better. Um, you know, the, the drawback that you run into, you know, where you go, if you were to go with somebody like a troll or, or obsidian men who have the higher strength yeah. is that they don't have the karma reserves. Um, and they frequently, um, have some penalties in other areas that make things a, a little bit more difficult. So orcs are, are, orcs are, are fantastic. I really like them. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, of really cool stuff that can be done with them. And one of my, I've mentioned this on the show in the past, I think is, is one of my, uh, if if I had time, wish list campaigns would be to run an orc focused like cavalry group campaign where everybody is sort of on horseback and dealing with stuff relating to that. You did. It was um, I think a a a Carafod campaign mm -hmm. um or an, an orc nomad campaign of some sort would be really, really interesting to explore. Yes. You mentioned that on the Cavalryman episode, actually. No, it's probably probably why <laughs> I brought it up. My favorite uh, orc word from the orc glossary. Uh, and I've used it a number of times in real life, is Ujnort. Those Ujnort, who do not yes. understand. Those who do not understand. So if you do not understand orcs by now, you are an Ujnort. <laughs> you are an Ujnort. <laughs> some, some, some races are iconically linked with a discipline. We talked about the Descrang is sort of like iconically linked with the Swordmaster yes. in Earthdawn. Mm -hmm. The orc is iconically linked with the cavalryman. Totally. Mostly because of the scorchers. Like the, like, yes. like the cavalryman discipline was, I think, created because of the orc culture yes. that was sort of initially fleshed out as they were developing the, the setting. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a discipline that was created largely like this is – these are orcs. This is what they are mm -hmm. like. Start. Uh, even though other races, yeah. you know, can be cavalrymen and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, d dwarves don't really have an iconic – discipline that they're associated with humans not really ah, fair just know. warrior fits everybody but, but, but orcs, otherwise yeah yeah but but orcs are like iconically linked with cavalrymen in a way that that few other discipline race combinations are yeah cannot speak highly enough so, about orc love love all of them period yeah we have we have talked a lot about orcs here and and um yeah i don't think we've got anything more to say i, I think we will <laughs> Wrap that one up. We will. Uh, any questions wrap this one on up. anything we've covered about orcs or the other emails? By all means, give us a shout out at uh, edsg podcast at gmail dot com. But until then, Ujnort, if you don't get it, it's time for you to go make your own orc legend. Seize your life and build your legend. Carpe diem. Good night, everybody. Orc.